problem. Concerning the future, I would like to say a few words on questions which a lady may ask you, questions which I often get asked by people who do not know too much about what is happening in society, such as, are relations with Rome broken off? Is it all over? A lightweight solution. I received a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, yet another telephone call from Cardinal Odie. Well, Excellency, is there no way to arrange things? No way? I replied, you must change. Come back to tradition. It is not just a question of the liturgy. It is a question of the faith. The Cardinal protested, no, no, it is not a question of faith. No, no. The Pope is ready and willing to receive you. Just a little gesture on your part and a little request for forgiveness and everything will be settled. That is just like Cardinal Odie. But he is going nowhere, nowhere. He understands nothing, or wants to understand nothing, nothing. Unfortunately, the same holds true for our four more or less traditional cardinals. Cardinals uh, Palazzini, Stickler, Gagnon, and Odi. They have no weight, no influence in Rome. They have lost all influence, and they are all, they're good for, all they are good for any longer is performing ordinations for St. Peter's Society, etc. They are going nowhere, nowhere. Meanwhile, the problem remains grave, very, very grave. We must absolutely not minimize it. This is how we must reply to the lay folk who ask such questions as when will the crisis come to an end? Are we getting anywhere? Isn't there any way of getting permission for our liturgy, for our sacraments? <clears throat> Certainly the question of the liturgy and the sacraments is important, but it is not the most important. The most important question is the question of the faith. This question is unresolved in Rome. For us, it is resolved. We have the faith of all time, the faith of the Catechism of the Council of Trent, of the Catechism of St. Pius X, hence the faith of the Church, of all the Church Councils, of all the Popes prior to Vatican II. Now the Official Church is persevering, we might say pertinaciously, in the false ideas and grave errors of Vatican II. That much is clear. Father Tam is sending us from Mexico a number of copies of a piece of work he is doing, most interesting work, because he is compiling cuttings from the Assuratore Romano, hence cuttings from Rome's official newspaper, the speeches of the Pope, of Cardinals Casseroli and Cardinal Ratzinger, official texts of the Church, and so on. It is interesting because such documents of public record are irrefutable, being published by the Observatory Romano, so there is no doubting their authenticity. Well, these texts are astounding, quite astounding. I shall quote you a few texts shortly. It is incredible. In the last few weeks, since I'm now unemployed, I have been spending a little time rereading the book by Emmanuel Barbier on liberal Catholicism, and it is striking to see how our fight is exactly the same fight as was being fought then by the great Catholics of the 19th century in the wake of the French Revolution and by the popes, Pius VI, Pius VII, Pius VIII, Gregory XVI, Pius IX, Leo XIII, and so on, Pius X, down to Pius XII. Their fight is summed up in the encyclical Quanta Cura with the syllabus of Pius IX and Facendi Dominici Gregis of Pius X. These are the two great documents, sensational and shocking in their day, laying out the Church's teaching in face of the modern errors, the errors appearing in the course of the Revolution, especially in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is the fight we are in the middle of today, exactly the same fight. There are those who are for the syllabus and Pashendi, and there are those who are against. It is simple, it is clear. Those who are against are adopting the principles of the French Revolution, the modern errors. Those who are for the syllabus and Pashendi remain with the true faith within Catholic doctrine. Now you know very well that Cardinal Ratzinger has said that as far as he is concerned, Vatican II is an anti-syllabus. Therewith, the Cardinal placed himself clearly amongst those who are against the syllabus. <clears throat> If then he is against the syllabus, he is adopting the principles of the revolution. Besides, he goes on to say quite clearly, Indeed, we have now absorbed into church teaching, and the church has opened herself up to principles which are not hers, but which come from modern society. That is, as everyone understands, the principles of 1789, the rights of man. We stand exactly where Cardinal Pie, Monsignor Frappel, Louis Velo stood, and Deputy Keller and Alsa, um, Al Alsace, Cardinal Mermilode in Switzerland, who fought the good fight together with the great majority of the then bishops. At that time, they had the good fortune to have the large majority of the bishops on their side. Monsignor Dupanloup and the few bishops in France who followed Monsignor Dupanloup were the odd ones out. The few bishops in Germany, the few in Italy, 
who were openly opposed to the syllabus and, in effect, opposed to Pius IX. They were the exception rather than the rule. But obviously, there were the forces of the revolution, the heirs of the revolution, and there was the hand reached out by Dupenloup, Montan Lambert, Lamennais, and others who offered their hands to the revolution and who never wanted to invoke the rights of God against the rights of man. We ask only for the rights of man and rights shared by everyone, shared by all men, shared by the, all religions, not the rights of God, said these liberals. Well, we, we find ourselves in the same situation. We must not be under any illusions. Consequently, we are in the thick of a great fight, a great fight. We are fighting a fight guaranteed by a whole line of popes. Hence, we should have, have no hesitation or fear. Hesitation such as, why should we be going on our own? After all, why not join Rome? Why not join the Pope? Yes, if Rome and the Pope were in line with tradition, if they were carrying on the work of all the Popes in the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, of course, <laughs> but they themselves admit that they have set out on a new path. They themselves admit that a new era began with Vatican II. They admit that it is a new stage in the Church's life, wholly new, based on new principles. We need not argue the point. They say it themselves. It is clear. I think that we must drive this point home with our people in such a way that they realize their oneness with the Church's whole history going back well beyond the Revolution. Of course, it is a good fight of the city of Satan against the city of God, clearly. So we do not have to worry. We must, after all, trust in the grace of God. What is going to happen? How is it all going to end? That is God's secret, mystery. But that we must fight, the ideas presently fashionable in Rome, coming from the Pope's own mouth, Cardinal Ratzinger's mouth, Cardinal Casseroli's mouth, of Cardinal Willebrand's and those like them, is clear. Clear for all they do is repeat the opposite of what the Pope said and solemnly stated for 150 years. We must choose, as I said to Pope Paul VI, we have to choose between you and the Council on one side and your predecessors on the other, either with your predecessors who stated the Church's teaching or with the novelties of Vatican II. Reply, all oh, this is not the moment to get into theology. We are not getting into theology now. It is clear. Hence, we must not waver for one moment. And we must not waver for one moment either in not being with those who are in the process of betraying us. Some people are always admiring the grass in the neighbor's field. Instead of looking to their friends, to the church's defenders, to those fighting on the battlefield, they look to our enemies on the other side. After all, we must be charitable. We must be kind. We must not be divisive. After all, they are celebrating the Tridentine Mass. They are not as bad as everyone else, but they are betraying us, betraying us. They are shaking hands with the Church's destroyers. They are shaking hands with people holding modernist and liberal ideas condemned by the Church. So they are doing the devil's work. Thus, those who are with us and were working with us for the rights of our Lord, for the salvation of souls, are now saying, so long as they grant us the old Mass, we can shake hands with Rome, no problem. But we are seeing how it works. They are in an impossible situation, impossible. One cannot both shake hands with the modernists and keep following tradition. Not possible, not possible. Now stay in touch with them to bring them back, to convert them to tradition. Yes, if you like, that's the right kind of ecumenism. But give the impression that after all, one almost regrets any break, that one li likes talking to them? No way, these are people who call us corpse-like traditionalists. They are saying we are as rigid as corpses, Ours is not a living tradition. We are glum-faced. Ours is a glum tradition. Unbelievable. Unimaginable. What kind of relations can you have with people like that? This is what causes us a problem with certain people who are very nice, very good people, all for the society, who accepted the consecrations, but who have a kind of deep-down regret that they are no longer with the people they used to be with, people who did not accept the consecrations and who are now against us. It's a pity we're divided, they say. Why not meet up with them? Let's go and have a drink together. Reach out a hand to them. That's a betrayal. Those saying this give the impression that at the drop of a hat, they would cross over and join those who left us. They must make up their minds. <clears throat> that is what killed Christendom in all of Europe. Not just the church in France, but, but the church in Germany and Switzerland. That is what enabled the revolution to get established. It was the liberals. It was those who reached out a hand to people who did not share their Catholic principles. We must make up our minds if we too want to collaborate in the destruction of the church and the ruin of the social kingship of Christ the King, or are we resolved to continue working for the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ?
All those who wish to join us and work with us, Deo gracias, we welcome them, wherever they come from. That's not a problem. But let them come with us, and let them not say they are going a different way in order to keep company with the liberals that left us, and in order to work with them. Not possible. Catholics right down the 19th century were torn apart, literally torn apart over the syllabus. For, against, for, against. And you remember in particular what happened with the Count of Chambord. He was criticized for not accepting to be made King of France after the 1870 revolution in France on the grounds of changing the French flag. But, but it was not so much a question of the flag. Rather, he refused to submit to the principles of the revolution. He said, I shall never consent to being the lawful king of the revolution. He was right, for he would have been voted in by the country, voted in by the French parliament, but on condition he accept to be a parliamentary king, and so accept the principles of the revolution. He said, no, if I am to be king, I shall be king like my ancestors were before the revolution. He was right. One has to choose. He chose to stay with the Pope and with pre-revolutionary principles. We too have chosen to be counter-revolutionary, to stay with the syllabus, to be against the modern errors, to stay with Catholic truth, to defend Catholic truth. We are right. Vatican II profoundly wrong. This fight between the church and the liberals and modernism is the fight over Vatican II. It is as simple as that, and the consequences are far-reaching. The more one analyzes the documents of Vatican II, and the more one analyzes their interpretation by the authorities of the church, the more one realizes that what is at stake is not merely superficial errors, a few mistakes, ecumenism, religious liberty, collegiality, a certain liberalism, but rather a wholesale perversion of the mind, a whole new philosophy based on modern philosophy, on subjectivism. A book just published by a German theologian is most instructive. It shows how the Pope's thinking, especially in a retreat he preached at the Vatican, is subjectivist from start to finish. And when afterwards one reads his speeches, one realizes that indeed, that is his thinking. It might appear Catholic, but Catholic it is not. No, the Pope's notion of God, the Pope's notion of our Lord, come from the depths of his consciousness, and not from any objective revelation to which he adheres with his mind. No, he constructs the notion of God. He said recently in a document, incredible, that the idea of the Trinity could only have arisen quite late because man's interior psychology had to be capable of defining the Trinity. Hence, the idea of the Trinity did not come from a revelation from outside. It came from man's consciousness inside. It welled up from inside man. It came from the depths of man's consciousness. Incredible, a wholly different version of revelation, of faith, of philosophy. Very grave, a total perversion. How are we going to get out of all this? I have no idea, but in any case, it is a fact. And as this German theologian shows, who has, I believe, another two parts of his book to write on the Holy Father's thought, it is truly frightening. So there are no small errors. We are not dealing in trifles. We are into a line of philosophical thinking that goes back to Kant, Descartes, or the whole line of modern philosophers who paved the way for the revolution. Let me give you a few relatively recent quotations, for example, on ecumenism. In the Observatory Romano of June 2nd, 1989, when the Pope was in Norway, quote, my visit to the Scandinavian countries is a confirmation of the Catholic Church's interest in the work of ecumenism, which is to promote unity amongst Christians, amongst all Christians. 25 years ago, the Second Vatican Council insisted clearly on the urgency of this challenge to the Church. My predecessors pursued this objective with persevering attention, with the grace of the Holy Ghost, which is a divine source and guarantee of the ecumenical movement. Since the beginning of my pontificate, I have made ecumenism the priority of my pastoral concern. It is clear. Now when one reads a quantity of documents on ecumenism, he makes speech after speech on ecumenism because he receives delegation after delegation from the Orthodox, from all religions, from all sects. So the subject is always ecumenism, ecumenism, ecumenism. But he achieves nothing. The end result has been nothing, nothing at all, except, on the contrary, reassuring the non-Catholics in their errors without seeking to convert them, the confirming of them in their error. The Church has made no progress, not the least progress, by this ecumenism. So all that he says is a veritable mishmash, communion, drawing closer, desire of imminent perfection, of imminent perfect communion, hope of communing in the sacrament, in unity, and so on, a mishmash, no real progress. They cannot progress this way, impossible. 
Take next Cardinal Casseroli from the Osservatore Romano in February 1989. <laughs> Speaking to the United Nations Commission on the, of the Rights of Man, just see what a speech it is. Quote, in responding with great pleasure to the invitation extended to me to come before you and bringing to you the encouragement of the Holy See, I desire to spend a few moments, as all of you will understand, on one specific aspect of the basic liberty of thought and action in accordance with one's conscious, religious liberty. Unquote. Such things coming from the mouth of an archbishop, liberty of thought and action according to one's conscience, hence conscience, hence religious liberty. Pope, Pope, Pope John, Paul II, John Paul II did not hesitate to state last year in a message for the World Day of Peace that religious liberty constitutes like a cornerstone in the edifice of the rights of man. The Catholic Church and its supreme pastor, who has made of the rights of man one of the major themes of his preaching, have not failed to recall that in a world made by man and for man. Unquote. Cardinal Casaroli's own words. Quote, the whole organization of society only has meaning insofar as it makes of the human dimension a central preoccupation. Unquote. God, God, no divine dimension in man. It is appalling. Paganism. Appalling. Then he goes on. Every man and all of man, that is the Holy See's preoccupation. Such, no doubt, is yours also. What can you do with people like that? One, what can we have in common with people like that? Nothing. Impossible. On to our well-known Cardinal Ratzinger, who made the remark that the Vatican II document Gaudi Metzbez was a counter-syllabus. He finds it nevertheless awkward to have made such a remark because people are now constantly quoting it back to him as a criticism. You said the Vatican II is a counter-syllabus. Hey, wait a minute, that is serious. So he has found an explanation. He gave it just a little while ago, on June 27, 1990. You know that Rome recently issued a major document to explain the relationship between the magisterium and the theologians. With all the problems theologians are causing them on all sides, Rome no longer knows what to do. So they have to try to keep the theologians in line without coming down too hard on them. So they go on and on, page after page, in this document. Now, in the presentation of the document, Cardinal Ratzinger gives us of his thinking on the possibility of saying the opposite of what popes have previously decided 100 years ago or whenever. The instruction on the, on the ecclesial vocation of the theologian, says the cardinal, quote, states for the first time and with such clarity, unquote, and I indeed I think it is true, quote, that there are decisions of the magisterium which cannot be and are not intended to be the last word on the matter as such, but are a substantial anchorage in the problem. Quote, unquote. Ah, the cardinal is an artful dodger. So there are decisions of the magisterium, that is not just any decisions, which cannot be the last word on the matter as such, but are merely a substantial anchorage in the problem. The cardinal continues, quote, and they are first and foremost an expression of pastoral prudence, a sort of provisional disposition, unquote. Listen. A de 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 definitive decisions of the Holy See being turned into pro 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 provisional dispositions. The cardinal goes on, quote, their core remains valid, but the individual details influenced by the circumstances at the time may need further rectification. In this regard, one can refer to the statements of the popes during the last century on religious freedom, as well as the anti-modernistic decisions at the beginning of this century, especially the decision of the biblical commission of that time, unquote. Those are decisions the Cardinal could not digest. Hence, three definitive statements of the Magisterium may be put aside because they were only provisional. Listen to the Cardinal, who goes on to say that these anti-modernist decisions of the Church rendered a great service in their day by, quote, warning against hasty and superficial adaptations, unquote, and, quote, by keeping the Church from sinking into the liberal Burgoyne's world. But the details of the determinations of their contents were later superseded once they had carried out their pastoral duty at a particular moment, unquote. Observatory Romano, English edition, July 2nd, 1990, page five. So we turn over the page and say no more about them. So you see how the Cardinal has got out of the accusation of going a bit far when he calls Vatican II an anti-syllabus. When he opposes the pontifical commit decisions and the magisterium of the past, he's found the way out. The core remains valid. What core? No idea. But the individual details influenced by the circumstances at the time may need further rectification. And there he has it. He is out of his difficulty. So by way of conclusion, either we are the heirs of the Catholic Church, 
that is a quantikira, a pashendi, with all the popes down to the council and with the great majority of the bishops prior to the council for the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the salvation of souls, or we are heirs of those who strive even at the price of breaking with the Catholic Church and her doctrine to acknowledge the principles of the rights of man based on a veritable apostasy in order to obtain a place as servants in the revolutionary world government. That is it. They will manage to get quite a good place in the revolutionary world government because by saying they are in favor of the rights of man, religious liberty, democracy, and human equality, clearly they are worth being given a position as servants in the world government. I think that if I say these things to you, it is to put our own fight in its historical context. It did not begin with Vatican II, obviously. It goes much farther back. It is a tough fight, very painful. Blood has flown in this flight, fight, and in quantities. And then the persecution, separation of church and state, religious and nuns driven into exile, the sequestering of church property, and so on. And not only in France, but also in Switzerland, in Germany, in Italy, the occupation of the pontifical states, driving the Pope back into the Vatican, abominations against the Pope, frightening. Well, are we with all these innovators and against the doctrine professed by the popes, against their voice raised in protest to defend the church's rights, our Lord's rights to defend souls? I think we have truly a strength and a base to stand on which do not come from us, and that is what is good. It is not our fight. It is the Lord's fight, which a church has carried on. So we cannot waver. Either we are for the church, or we are against the church, and for the new conciliar church, which has nothing to do with the Catholic Church, or less and less to do with it. For when the Pope used to speak about the rights of men, to begin with, he used to allude also to the duties of men, but no longer, no longer. The rights of men, and this insistence on everything for man, everything by man, truly appalling. I wish to lay out a few of these thoughts for you to fortify yourselves, and realize the fight you are carrying on, with the grace of God, because it is obvious we would no longer be in existence if the good Lord was not with us. That is clear. There have been at least four or five occasions when the Society of St. Pius X should have disappeared. Well, here we are, still, thanks be to God, and goodness gracious, we carry on. We should especially have disappeared at the time of the consecrations in 1988, so we were told beforehand. All the prophets of doom, and even amongst those close to us, said, No, no, your grace, do not do that. That is the end of your society. You can be sure. We assure you, that is the end. It will be all over. You can close down. Yet we survive. No, the good Lord does not want his fight to come to an end. Fight in which there have been martyrs. Martyrs of the revolution and all those who have been mortal mar moral martyrs by dint of the persecutions they underwent during the 19th century. Even in our own century, St. Pius X was a martyr. All these heroes of the faith, the persecuted bishops, the sequestered convents, the exiled nuns, are all these to be nothing? That whole fight is to have been a fight for nothing. That whole fight is to have been a fight for nothing, a fight in vain, a fight which condemns those who are as victims and martyrs? Impossible. So we find ourselves caught up in the same current, in the continuation of the same fight, and we thank God. That we are being persecuted is obvious. How could we not be persecuted? We are the only ones to be excommunicated. No one else is. We are the only ones being persecuted, even in material matters. For example, our Swiss colleagues are being obliged again to do their military service. That is persecution by the Swiss government. In France, they are persecuting the society's French district by blocking legacies from being handed over to the district. This in the attempt to stifle us by cutting off our income. This is persecution. Of such a kind as history is full of, it is merely continuing, and God works his way around it. Normally, our French district should have been stifled, and we should have had to shut down our schools, to close down all the institutions which cost us money. But that situation has gone on for over two years, and Providence has allowed for our benefactors to be generous, and for funds to come in. So we have been able to continue despite this iniquitous persecution. Iniquitous, because the law, the state of the law, is on our side. But there is a letter to the French minister from Cardinal Lustiger asking him to block our legacies. And this letter did not come out of nowhere. It was written under the influence of Monsignor Perrault. Perrault. It is he, the damned soul. It is he. He was all smiles when he came on the official visitation of the society in 1987. But he was the evil genius of that visitation. He thought he had us where he wanted when he cut off our funds. So we must not worry, for when we look behind us, 
we are still not as unfortunate as those Catholics expro expropriated at the beginning of this century who found nothing themselves out on the street with nothing. Who found themselves out on the street with nothing. That may happen to us one day. I do not look forward to it. But the more we expand, the more we will arouse jealousy on the part of all those who do not care for us. We must count on the good Lord, on the grace of the good Lord. What is going to happen, I do not know. Perhaps the coming of Elias. I was just reading this morning in Holy Scripture. Elias will return and put everything back in place. Et omnia restituit. And he will restore all things. Goodness gracious, let him come straight away. I do not know. But humanly speaking, there is no chance of any agreement between Rome and ourselves at the moment. Someone was saying to me yesterday, but what if Rome accepted your bishops, and then you were completely exempted from the other bishops' jurisdiction? But firstly, they are a long way right now from accepting any such thing, and then let them first make such an offer. But I do not think they are anywhere near doing so. For what has been up till now, the difficulty has been precisely their giving us a tr traditionalist bishop. They did not want to. It had to be a bishop according to the profile laid down by the Holy See. Profile. You see what that means? Impossible. They knew very well that by giving us a traditional bishop, they would be setting up traditionalist, a traditionalist citadel able to continue. That they did not want, nor did they give it to St. Peter's Society. When St. Peter's say they signed the same protocol as we did on May 1988, it is not true, because in our protocol there was one bishop and two members of the Roman Commission, of which their protocol had neither. So they did not sign the same protocol as we did. Rome took advantage of drawing up a new protocol to remove those two concessions. At all costs, they wanted to avoid that. So we did, so we had to do as we did on June 30, 1988. In any case, I'm happy to be able to encourage you and congratulate you on the work you are doing. The complaints now are rare, and how many people write to me, write to me their gratitude for the work of the priests of the Society of St. Pius X. For them, the Society is their life. They have rediscovered the life they wanted, the way of the faith, the family spirit they need, the desire for Christian education, all these schools, together with all that our sisters and fathers are doing, and all our friends who work together to continue tradition. All that is marvelous in the age we are living in. The people are truly grateful, deeply grateful. So carry on your work and organize. I hope that little by little our various communities will be able to increase in numbers so as to provide more mutual support for you all moral and physical, so that you can maintain your present fervor. I wish to thank all the superiors for their zeal and devotion. I think the good Lord has chosen the society, has wanted the society. In November, we reach the society's 20th anniversary, and I am intimately convinced that it is the, good, that it is the society which represents what the good Lord wants, to continue and maintain the faith, maintain the truth of the church, maintain what can still be saved in the church. Thanks to the bishops grouped around the superior general, playing their indispensable part, the guardians of the faith, or preachers of the faith, of giving the grace of the priesthood, the grace of confirmation, things that are irreplaceable and absolutely necessary. So all that is highly consoling. I think we should thank God and enable it to carry on so that one day people are forced to recognize that although the visitation of 1987 bore little fruit, yet it showed that we were there and that good was being done by the society, even if they did not wish to say so explicitly outside our circles of after the visitation. However, one day they will be obliged to recognize that the society represents a spiritual force and a strength of the faith which is irreplaceable and which they will have, I hope, the hope and the satisfaction to make use of But when they come back to their traditional faith. Let us pray to the Blessed Virgin and let us ask Our Lady Fatima for all our intentions on all the pilgrimages we make in various countries, that she come to the aid of the society, that it may have numerous vocations. Obviously, we would like to have some more vocations. Our seminaries are not filled. We would like them to be filled. However, with the grace of God, it will come. So once more, thank you, and please pray for me that I die a good and holy death, because I think that is all I still have to do.